Next slide. And that's the image. Um, and of course, uh, um, America and uh, France both conspired uh, through economic sanctions to destroy Haiti. Um, Haiti had to pay reparations to France uh, from 1875 to 1947, an estimated uh, what would be the equivalent of $20 billion were paid, was paid to France. Um, so the Toussaint Louverture, great hero. Next slide, please. David Walker, the abolitionist, uh, was also uh, unearthed by Arthur Schomburg. Next, next slide. This is the rough sketch. Next. And for the background, I used a house that's still operational that was filmed for the movie, uh, as an exterior shot for the movie Gone with the Wind. So I used that as a background. This is my former student, Alejandro, who posed as um, David Walker. And then I combined all the reference shots to create this. Is, this is the underdrawing that I do on a large sheet of watercolor paper. There, a color sketch before I start to paint. Next. And the other painting. Next. And this is work in progress. As you see, the house is on fire. And uh, that is, person in the background is Nat Turner. Okay, that Arthur Schomburg also discovered. There's a section in the book um, called Whitewash, and these are heroes throughout history that were descendants of Africans that history has chosen to forget, like Alexander Pushkin, whose father was an African, uh, Beethoven, whose mother was um, from Northern Africa, Next. James Audubon, whose uh, mother was French Creole, and Alexander Dumas, Next whose father was an African who was a fierce warrior and general in, in Napoleon's army. Next. Uh, we know that Arthur Schomburg befriended Marcus Garvey, another personal hero of mine. Next. He married three women um, named Elizabeth, which is kind of <laughs> peculiar, but okay. Uh, next. Uh, these are other images is when Elizabeth tries to straighten up his desk and got herself in you can see she wasn't taking his stuff. So. Okay, <laughs> next. Uh, Arthur Schomburg was fond of getting together with uh, authors and artists and getting them together. And for, uh, the idea of the uh, library as a communal space perhaps was born with Arthur Schomburg. Next slide. These are all the characters that are mentioned uh, in the story here. So let's go to the next. He's also responsible for introducing um, Langston Hughes to Nicholas Guillen, the famous Cuban poet. Next slide, please. This is in 1926 when the collection is sold. Okay, and he begins collecting uh, art from all over the world. Okay, that proved the historical significance of people who have African descent. The two sketches uh, that were rejected for the cover, that then eventually the, the third one, next, was accepted. Mm -hmm. And then once this was uh, accepted, I shot myself in the back. <laughs> I shot myself. Yeah, I had a reference shot of myself in the backyard. Next. And I collected reference photos um, the, of, of the way the uh, library looks today and the way it may have looked in 1926. Next. Okay, underdrawing. Next. Color sketch. Uh, that's to get all the colors just right so I'm not fumbling at the end, changing, thing, uh, ch changing colors and, you know, messing around. Okay, next. Okay, underdrawing in acrylic paint, next. Okay, I always paint the thing that's furthest away first. And here's the sky and the buildings, next. Okay, you see now the uh, pants and the shoes uh, are coming in, next. And this is pretty much how it looks when it leaves the studio. And then I take off the tape, send it into Candlewick, and they <laughs> put the titles on. Okay, next. And that's where I conclude. Thank you. Marvelous. Yeah. Oh, that was great. I love seeing things in progress like that. It's a lot of information. So our next speaker is the author, Meg Medina, who is a dear friend to the Library of Congress, and we're happy to have you back today. Meg is a founding member of We Need Diverse Books, and she serves on its advisory board. She is a prolific writer. Um, she writes for children, she writes for teens, and she has won numerous awards, including the Ezra Jack Keats Award, as well as the, the Cura Belpre Award and an Honor Medal. Um, she also has her name on the long list for the 2016 National Book Award. Her next novel, Merci Suarez Changes Gears, is due to come out this fall. Meg, welcome. 
Thank you. And of course, I will that you love Cuban music. I Me too. Music. <laughs> we yes. have a lot to talk yes. about. Yes. <laughs> that was beautiful. So I, I come into this conversation as someone who is the direct beneficiary of the vision and work of librarians like Cura Beltre and Arturo Schomburg. And I have, I wanted to start with a really embarrassing and painful admission. And that's that when I won the Cura Beltre uh, Award for Yaqui Delgado in 2014, I had only the merest idea of who Cura Beltre was. And I had virtually no connection to Schomburg at all, except that I was a New Yorker and I knew about the Schomburg Center, but I knew nothing of the man. And that is a really sad thing to admit. And it's sad because I am a Latina and I love to read as a child. It's sad because I'm a Latina who became a public school teacher and I had dedicated myself to giving kids the best education I thought possible, right? It's sad because I'm a Latina who writes for young people right now in the hope of blanketing them in a sense of pride and self-awareness of their beautiful roots. And yet, these two titans, these two heroes, working in a field that is so aligned with who I am and dear to my heart, were barely visible to me. And I think that that is a symptom, as Marilisa suggested, of the sexism in the case of Cura del Pre, and of the cultural erasure in, in the barest and racial form for both of them, for mm -hmm. both Arturo and for Cura. So through that lens, I'm really thankful for the scholarship and for the artistic expression that the three of you have shared here with regard to two enormously important librarians who made their life's work around the intellectual life of Latino children and specifically Afro-Latino children. So I want to talk also about the fact that these two heroes were librarians, gloriously bookish people. <laughs> and I love that. And I love to underscore that to young people as we did this morning. We were talking about what are heroes. And, and when you talk to a kid and you say hero, they don't immediately conjure up an image of somebody working in the stacks, you know? Um, but really they ought to. And I think that they ought to know that. And they ought to know that the, this library, really any public library, is the beating soul of a vibrant and free people. Mm. And yet, we internalize so many barriers without being aware that we've internalized them. And Marilisa and I have talked about this over the years so many times. I am not a stranger to libraries. My mother made sure I had a library card when I was a little kid in Queens, and that um, was a decision that communicated to me her belief that books and reading had value. And I do lots of programming as an adult, as an author, and I, I do lots of my writing in libraries. In fact, it's a joke in Richmond where I live. Um, when I come in and I start working at the library, they all start swarming around seeing what I'm writing and saying hello. It's like a big, exciting thing. But when I came to this library, very specifically, the Jefferson part of the um, Library of Congress, even as an adult, with all kinds of credentials to my name, I had to first shake off the feeling, this terrible anguish, this secret feeling that I didn't belong here. And there was something about the grandeur of it, the beautiful paintings, the sense of the official and the important, the real American story, so to speak. And it all seemed unfamiliar and overwhelming to me. And at the time, I had no existence of the Hispanic Reading Room, uh, which houses a beautiful collection that Carolina is going to tell us about in a few minutes. And I'm only recently connecting with all kinds of resources like some Latino, et cetera. And my first steps were actually here, to this center, to the Young Reader Center, where families can come after dragging their children to see all sorts of things in Washington, D.C. <laughs> for a few Parents minutes of rest. Don't you do that? <laughs> oh, they do. They come in sweating and teary, and they find a nice beanbag chair and a book. And back then, I was doing pro programming for Dia de los Niños for the first time, just like we are gathered here to do it today. And it was life-changing for me to see my titles for the first time on these shelves, 
because it communicated to me that my work did belong, and more importantly, that I was part of the larger American fabric of letters mm -hmm. for children. Eventually, I walked down and went across the street and I got my researcher library card and have an ugly picture on my ID <laughs> because I was working on my new novel, Burn Baby Burn, at the time. And I remember that that day, and a little bit like now, I got teary over that. I ended up doing a lot of research for my novel, Burn Baby Burn, here in the periodical room. And the habit continues. I'm very proud to say that I'll be back next week working um, preliminary research on a historical picture book. I'm trying to see if I can bring to life a musician who was beloved in Cuba and Mexico and throughout Latin America, but barely known here in the US. What a comfort for me to discover that the resources are just a short train ride from my home. The sound recordings, the music, the books and articles, photo documentation, it's an amazing affirmation to know that we Latinos are part of the library in this really essential way. The very same national library system that Pura and Arturo were part of too. So I don't want anybody else to have to wait to adulthood to know about their own heroes or about these resources. I think to the extent that you educators out there and parents and whoever's watching, to the extent that you can encourage young people to access the Library of Congress and its resources, you're doing them an enormous service, a life-changing service. Through creative work, perhaps through research in spaces like this, we offer them a way to discover the places where they can access their past and understand, finally, how they got here, physically sure, how I came from X country to this place, but also, and more importantly, how did your people get here intellectually and culturally? And of course, we're also offering them a tangible resource that can buffer them against the ne negative stereotypes and the incomplete information that abounds at present. Stereotypes that might say that we have no interest in books or reading, that we are not a quote-unquote cultured people, that we have very little that is worth cataloging, in a place like this. And finally, what I want to say is really just an expression of gratitude to the librarians and scholars who are interested in young people's literature. There's a long tradition of trivializing works for young people, and to some extent, trivializing the careers of people who are dedicated to that. Um, and in the case of works by writers from marginalized communities, the work of getting published and getting the books in the hands of children can be a daunting task. But we writers and illustrators are in the business of children. The job of creating children who are literate and empathetic and who have healthy self-concept doesn't happen without quality literature for them. The questions about who is writing, about what is being written, about what isn't being written, about the gaps and spaces that remain, all of those things inform us creatively. Scholarship around our work elevates us all. And I'm so grateful to you for that, Mari Lisa, and to the many others, such as Carol and Eric, who make incredible work. And all of the authors out there who are making incredible work that name the Latino experience. And with that, I just want to say happy Dia to everyone, <laughs> and also to turn it over to we're going to get a couple of questions, and then after a couple of questions, I'm going to let Catalina tell us more about resources that are available from the library. But first, I know that many of you out there are probably anxious because you've been sitting still and listening for a while, and it's your turn to talk at us. So if you have a question, um, please indicate that you have a question and unmute your site and fire away. Anything you want to ask, please, for Then I'll talk at once. <laughs> <laughs> we just you, can, see. you can just tell us about your favorite librarian, too. <laughs> oh, come on, let's make sure the technology's working. Can I just, how about, okay, how about in Fort Vancouver Regional Library in Washington State, there's a person wearing like a pinkish red shirt <laughs> in the back row. I bet you have a good librarian story. 
Okay. Yay! They're unmuting in Washington. <laughs> we are unmuted. Um, I don't know. I haven't come up with a question yet. This has just been marvelous to hear all of this, and I'm still going through. And I'm sorry, I don't have a question off the top of my head, but this has been wonderful. Um, yeah, I'm just so tickled that the technology is working, and then I can pick on you as if you were one of my <laughs> former students. That was marvelous. Thank you. <laughs> All right, did the Schomburg Center have a question? Yeah. Down here, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're unmuted. Can you hear? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Linda Caicedo. I worked at the Library, the New York Public Library, uh, 35 years, and I'm retired. Um, and I met Cora Pedre in 1982, the year that she oh. passed from. Um, she inspired me to stay with the library because it was a little discouraging at first, but um, she was one of my muses, I guess you would say. Um, I went to Puerto Rico several times and I met up with a librarian in Puerto Rico that had written a book about Schomburg in Spanish. And since it was many, many years ago, uh, she had, um, she was a friend of my mother's sister and the book was in Spanish and I've been looking for it for many years. I think it's out of print now. But it was one of the only books that was published, and it was published, I think, in the early 1970s. So it was quite a long time ago. Um, and I'm just wondering if these books that were written about Schomburg many, many years ago, and that are out of print, are in the Library of Congress, and if they are, uh, how do we gain access to them? Because I have not been able to trace them. Now this particular woman that wrote this book in Spanish is a very rare book because Schomburg was really not known in Puerto Rico because of the fact that he was African American, Puerto Rican, black Puerto Rican. And in Puerto Rico at that time, that was not a, a really popular thing to have around. So my question is, uh, in the Library of Congress, if they can track that book, I mean, that you know, the Library of Congress usually has every book, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's my homework, I'll, I'll get on it. If that book was taken out of print, maybe because it had some serious flaws in it, because of the fact that maybe it was written with a, maybe a little racial tinge to it, or that it was just taken out of print because it was not an interesting enough title for the libraries to keep. It might have been because it had some flaws. Yeah, great question. I, I have to say that as you were describing the book, even before you asked your question, the question that came to my mind was, gee, I wonder if it's here at the library. And then I looked over at Catalina and I could tell she was doing the exact same thing. So I love, I don't know if you heard what Catalina said. She said, now she knows what her homework is. She's yes. gonna go look for it. Because I've been trying to track it down. And oh, yeah. I, I actually have, I think I have a copy of it in my house somewhere. But <laughs> uh, I've moved very many, many How much Puerto Rico? Oh. You know, I haven't been able to track it down, and it might be in Puerto Rico also because I think I left it, but my mother's house was destroyed in the hurricane, so a lot of the books that I had in Puerto Rico were destroyed. So I might have lost hope. So I'm really looking for that book, get access to it. Now, great. thank you for mentioning that. I. From the looks of things, I think Eric and Catalina have a plan because Eric knows exactly the book you're talking about and is gonna give Catalina the information. And so actually this is a good segue 
Why don't we go ahead and let Catalina go ahead and tell you a little bit about the Hispanic division here at the library. And let me be a little more official. Catalina Gomez is my colleague who works in the Hispanic division here at the Library of Congress. She is a reference librarian and is the curator of the Archive of Hispanic Literature on Tape, a historic literary audio archive containing recordings of prominent poets and prose writers from the Luso Hispanic world reading from their own works. She also serves as the recommending officer for collections here at the Library of Congress from Colombia, Venezuela, as well as material on Latin America, Latin American art for the Library of Congress. Catalina, thank you for being here. And <laughs> well, I love what Meg said about having been to the library and not realizing there was a Hispanic reading room. So everything you can share, I think, will be really of interest. Yes, well, it's, well, it's just so thrilling to be here. Um, it's such an honor that you got to talk about librarians with heroes, specifically. You guys are like, for librarians, yeah. authors like you are, our heroes. <laughs> and I think it's just great when people like you can come into a library and then that's where the magic happens. And this is so great. But so yes, the Library of Congress is not just the National Library, it's an it's a universal library and, and um, not many people know that, um, but there are collections in, in this uh, great library from all over the world and all of all of the languages of the world. And I happen to work in the Hispanic Reading Room, which is one of our international uh, reading rooms, which was established in 1939. This was the first international reading room uh, that was open here at the library. But uh, since then, we have now a European division. There's an African, Middle Eastern, and Hebraic division, as well as an Asian division. And um, we, that we librarians who work in these um, reading rooms are here to help uh, anyone who is curious or who's doing research on any of these countries or anything related to these, these parts of the world. So um, uh, our, these collections are really vast. So for, from Latin America, we have more than 10 million items um, uh, from books uh, to films, to audio recordings, to um, pho photographs, prints, and art. Um, so it's, it's really thrilling to be in a place like this and I'm happy to be here with all of you. Um, uh, I just got really inspired by all of all of your all of your work and um, this concept of um, bringing voice to the voiceless and this work that you guys do that is just so powerful and important. And because of this, I thought it was really special to talk about a project project that I work on um, here, which is a collection of audio audio recordings uh, of poets and writers from the Luso Hispanic world. Um, Luso Hispanic, uh, just cl clarifying, Luso also means Portuguese language. So, um, in my division, we also cover Portugal and Brazil. Uh, so, this collection is a collection of close to 800 audio recordings of poets and writers from the Luso Hispanic world. So, Portugal, Spain, Latin America, the Caribbean, uh, reading from their works. Uh, it began in the early 1940s and um, um, it's a collection that includes, represents all, all of the 32 countries of the region, um, more than 10 languages. Uh, and we have um, very noteworthy figures like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Pablo Neruda, uh, Borges, um, many Caribbean writers. Um, uh, we have a long list from Cuba, um, Nicolas Guillén. Yes. Um, so it was thrilling for me to read a chamber that, uh, that Guillén he did as part of the archive. Um, his recordings are still online. And so um, this collection um, began in the 40s. It still continues to still record writers today. And um, we began uploading content from this archive online in 2015. Uh, and that's really what I've been um, in charge of is to digitize and bring these voices of these writers and poets to all of you. Uh, if you log into the library's website, you can find the project, uh, the Archive of Hispanic Literature on Tape, um, and you can click and listen to, for now, just a portion of the collection. And um, every year we add 50 more recordings from the archive to the website. Uh, but um, we can start this slide here. I just um, wanted to sort of uh, base based on the idea of voice and bringing voice to the voiceless, I wanted to also highlight certain writers that we have recorded. Um, I think the next slide is just a picture of the library. <laughs> um, and then the next one is um, 
a great photo that we have of, of Pablo Neruda reading here, um, actually two next rooms um, to the right here, the recording studio is right here next to the Young Leader Center. Uh, and this is Neruda, his recording is one of, you know, the most, one of the most famous recordings in the archives. And this is here in 1966. Um, so a lot of the writers come here physically to the library to record, even though some of the recordings happen um, out elsewhere. And we have some grants in the 50s and 60s. Well, not, I wasn't here. <laughs> but, um, my, uh, the founder of the archive, the creator, I mean, I what he lived out here. He was from Chile. Um, he was able to travel around um, and record voices. But this was actually here. Um, but um, the next slide, we, uh, I'm just, you know, highlighting, you know, the power of literature and that how literature can bring life to the invisible and give voice to the voiceless. And of course, many of the writers that are part of this archive do this work, you know, to, to um, bring testimony of um, people who have been silenced or, or um, injustice, injustices have been per perpetrated against them. Um, so I think I'm going to turn things a little bit sour, but I hope that <laughs> I hope that um, um, I think some of the most powerful poems that, in, in my opinion, um, that that illustrate this idea of giving voice to the voiceless um, are. I'm going to be talking a little about them for the next slide. Um, well, this is just an illustration of um, you know this work of, of putting the stories in a book and then in the, with, with the archive with a spoken word. Um, this archive brings yet another dimension to the story. This is not just in the book, this is, um, there's a recording of the author uh, reading the word, which I think has a lot of power to, to it. Uh, but then now, um, we'll do the next slide. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of um, a poem um, that was a, a, a part of a recording that was done for the archive by our former poet, Gloria Company Guerrera, uh, you know, great, you know, wonderful person, Chicano writer, uh, Chicano poet, um, who we got the privilege of having here at the library for two years as a poet laureate. Um, and um, I just wanted to show this poem because um, personally for me, this is one of my favorite poems by Juan Felipe, and it illustrates again this, this um, idea of testimony and bringing um, and, you know, giving voice, voice to the voiceless. And I, I think there's, um, the, the ultimate voices are those who have been silenced by being murdered and being uh, unfairly, um, yeah, killed. And, and so this is a poem about uh, 43 students that were kidnapped and murdered in, in the town of Iguala in Mexico, Mexico in 2014, in September 2014. Uh, and no one really knows what happened. With, with, with these students and it created, it created an uproar around Mexico and around the world, um, but no one really ever knew what happened. And um, the, this poem by, by Juan Felipe is dedicated to those students. So I wanted to play the poem. Um, and this is again on our website. So we're gonna hear the poem right now. That was yeah, that's it. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, that was part of that poem. Um, and then the next slide is actually a photo of some of the protests um, that <coughs> were sparked because of this this um, 
this occurrence in Mexico. Um, and then we can go to the next slide. And um, now so speaking about Juan Felipe, um, I wanted to do a little bit, a little bit of uh, an activity that he did here in the library last year. Uh, and it's also an example of how libraries and authors and stories can uh, um, you know, have an interplay. And um, he um, did this beautiful workshop with uh, the winners of the National Student, National Student Poets. Uh, they were really young poets uh, that are chosen from various high schools and they have to give this award. And he asked them to uh, look at a, a Mexican po codex of the Aztecs. And we told them the story behind the codex and then the murals that are in the Hispanic Reading that you all just saw. And he asked the kids to create a mural, um, sort of a paper mural. And so this is the photo that is part of that mural. And then the next two slides, the next slide also shows Juan mm. uh, Felipe with the students and um, he just has such an amazing way of, of bringing the library to life and bringing um, these stories uh, to life also in sort of a performative um, way with students, with audiences, and this was just very magical. Um, and so these poets were writing uh, poetry inspired by what they saw, and they were drawing, they were cutting uh, you know, parts of the codex that we, you know, we glued them up and, and we, um, so that was just an example of, um, of, of other Juan Felipe, of other Juan Felipe magic. Uh, <laughs> if you guys haven't read Juan Felipe's poetry, I truly recommend it. Uh, it's incredible. Um, and now we can move to the next slide. Uh, this is another example of um, this sort of testimony. And this she, uh, Valerie Martinez, a poet from New Mexico, also reported for our project, for our archive. And, um, and we're not going to play uh, this example, but I just wanted to mention her and this recording. Uh, um, Each and Her is a book-long poem uh, that she published in 2010. And it's, um, it, it's a book uh, um, in honor of all of the women that have been murdered in Ciudad Juarez since 1993. Uh, and it's, I, I was just speechless after um, she recorded that I was in the room and she recorded this. I mean, it's just, of an amazing work of art. And um, it was just incredible. Um, uh, and this is another example of, of writers bringing uh, to light um, you know, injustices and, and situations that the world could just forget. And no, there's been no really prosecution to any man that has been involved in any other murders. So this, you know, yet another example of um, the importance of this kind of kinds of books, you know, because they, they are trying to, to um, prevent the ultimate, you know, forgetting. So, mm -hmm. um, and then the last one is a little bit different, but it's another one of my favorite recordings. This one still hasn't made it to the website because we don't have the permission of the, the estate. We haven't been able to find the estate of this author, but um, uh, yeah, Angel Maria Garibay, he was a Mexican priest. Uh, a linguist, a historian, a philologist who studied pre-Columbian Mesoamerican societies. And he was one of the first people to translate into Spanish a lot of the Aztec poetry, so the poems that the Aztecs um, well, wrote mm -hmm. in, you know, during their time. And um, we have a recording by Cariuay, which is, I think, it's actually my favorite recording in the archive. And it's just amazing because he re reads the poems in English and in Spanish. And, um, Again, you know, a lot of you know these communities and these uh, are indigenous peoples in Latin America. Um, they're not forgot, forgotten, but they, you know, they. It's it's a sort of like that's like the story that the story wants to go to forget um, our indigenous past. Um, so um, in this archive, we also have recordings of, of writers who write in indigenous languages, who write in Nahuatl, who write in Amara, who write in Quechua. Who write in, um, um, yeah, I mean, also different languages spoken in Spain and, and um, Creole and French from French Caribbean, um, but definitely the indigenous languages. And um, so that's this recording is another example of, um, of you know, 
of, of material that we have that um, we're trying to rescue um, and find a different use for it. I'm really glad that you sh were sharing uh, descriptions of the recordings because, again, I think so often we think about libraries and we think about the books in them, but you literally are thinking about the voices that live in the libraries. And, like in this case, more and more of these recordings being made available online for us to mm -hmm. hear these voices. Mm -hmm. Love it. Um, Michael, if you'd go ahead and put the camera back on us, and I'm going to reach over here, and our colleague Sasha has a question for you that has come through Twitter. All right, and it says, um, the library is the soul of a free people. We agree. <laughs> yeah. We absolutely agree. All right. Yeah. And I'm, 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 okay. Attending this webinar with other librarians um, from um, ESD 112, yay. Um, yay for professional development across districts. We agree. Um, more, Dia Together LOC, we have a child coming tonight to perform as Pura Belfre. We will also be singing De Colores. Oh, yes. Awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Post um, pictures. That's marvelous. Yeah. Post and there's pictures. A, I was going to say, and she's included a photograph from Look the book. That. Oh, that's oh, great. Oh, I love it. Okay. Now you guys are competing with the Twitterers. You got to ask questions. <laughs> or comment. I can pick on you, remember? Okay, here we go. So the Free Library of Philadelphia, yay! Unmute yourselves. Okay. okay good. <laughs> um, I have a comment very quickly. Yes, Snow Hill Middle School. Okay. Okay, um, so we are a, and I actually have some of my students here behind me who chose to do this instead of some of their coding work, so it's an exciting day. Um, and I wanted to just say that, um, that I cannot tell you how meaningful it is. Everything that, that Library of Congress puts online is like a step way in the right direction for my kids. We live about three hours from DC, um, so we, it's like just out of reach. Um, and just a little bit too expensive for us to take a bus there. Um, so it makes it so that my students can access Library of Congress all the time, anytime. Um, they are very familiar with the resources available there by the time that they leave middle school. And um, it's something that I know I was never able to do in middle school. And I cannot tell you how much I appreciate that, that you all have made such a huge effort to get as many things online as possible. Thank you. Well, you are welcome. Marvelous. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, Free Library of Philadelphia. Uh, your audio is not quite picking up for us. Maybe just get a little closer to your mic, maybe. Yeah, we're still not hearing you. We know you're there. Yeah, we're type so if you want to type the question, that would work too. Um, yeah, in the um, in the group chat, we can see it as well. Uh, it's coming. It's coming. Thank goodness for the technology is fun. <laughs> There's all kinds of ways. There's to always a way out. Great. <laughs> Somebody from Schomburg, too. Yeah, Schomburg, can, can you hear? Yes. Can, can yeah. you hear this? Can you hear? Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Say yes. 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 Okay. Um. Have you ever heard of Westwood? Western Wood. Recordings. West. Western Wood recordings. Yeah. Yes. Western Wood. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Connecticut. Right. In Connecticut. Yeah. Exist, right. They still exist. Yeah. There was a time when they had um uh, cassettes. They recorded them. Mm. There were film strips. They were things that kids could just walk up to in the library and put it into a machine and then the kids could just sit there and listen and hear the voice right. of Pura Pelfre as she, she told the story of La Putra 
Panchita Martina. On one side it was in English, on the other side it was in Spanish. So the kids got both versions of the folk tale. Oh, wow. Oh, now we got more homework to do. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, um, yeah. I, I know the Center for Puerto Rican Studies has the sound recording of Belpre reading uh, Perez and Martina, but that used to be a component of some of the stories uh, and some of the books that she published where they would have her read and they actually would have the sound recording. Um, so I think it would be really important. I don't know. I don't know if there, if it's you can locate something like that here at the Library of Congress, but um, but definitely capturing um, the voice of her reading. I've had the opportunity to hear it. And it's very obviously very different when you actually get to hear the author's yeah. voice. But I think that also speaks to how the librarians that we're talking about and the, the role of the library too. That it's beyond just right the books that you can get off the shelf. That it's that living person and that that community that comes together at the library and um, the ability to hear stories and, and interact with books and, and, and interact with authors too. So um, I wanted to also emphasize that uh, if, if we could get a recording at some point, maybe here, if, if it's I'll possible. I'll look into it. I mean, but very likely because we could have in here. I think in Asia, I mean, it's not, it's not in Hispanic, that. maybe in the Folk Life Center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll have to do some digging. This is mm -hmm. good. So the question is, yes. it seems like okay. it's for All Carol. right, here we go. Question for Carol Weatherford. So it was a circulating collection. It was part of the circulating collection. And I'm wondering if maybe now, since we have YouTube, and we have all these other you know, uh, vehicles where kids can hear, right. if it can be somehow the li Library of Congress because I think, I don't know how many kids, you know, plug into the library of Congress. Really? Well, we hope more and more every day. And here, you know, Pura Fred Fred's voice, and then you know, stories straight from the voice of the writer. Um, okay, and some of the ones that are totally out of print right now that they have no access because the books don't exist anymore. Yeah. Um, the Rainbow Color Course, uh, these were in the reading collections, the, the reading room collections that don't exist anymore because now everything is either circulating or discarded. Right. There's no archival yep. reading room collections that are exist in many, many, many libraries now. Yeah. So it's a matter of finding yes. them and then it's a that matter person. of making them more widely available, yes. certainly. Mm -hmm. I think with Buddha's books in, in particular, um, I th I'm, I'm so glad that you highlighted the fact that the books are out of print, right? And, um, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to have the book back here is because I wanted people to remember that she's an author, right? She's not just the namesake of a, of a medal that she herself wrote books. Um, and if there's something, maybe we could all just mobilize you know, and, and find a way to get these books uh, back in print because I think that they're part of our history, right? And we should really uh, work to uh, make sure our authors are still represented. And it's interesting to me that the medal has really worked to keep a lot of authors actually in print, but her own works have been um, out of print for I don't know how long now. Um, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies does uh, reprint. They have a book that they published not too long ago that reprinted some of them. But I think it's very different. It's very sort of like an academic book as opposed uh, to, you know, the illustrations and like the Rainbow Colored Horse, which you talked about, which was uh, probably um, illustrated by Antonio Martorell. So there's just a value in, in having these artifacts, right, and, and having them available for our young people today. So we do have our question from the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm going to read it. It's a question for Carol Weatherford. What are the strengths and weaknesses of using poetry to convey biographical information as you did in Chamber? Do you have suggestions for librarians and teachers, or have you heard from them about how to share books like Chamber, poetic biographies, with young people? Schomburg is a little different than uh, most of my poetic biographies in that um, the story is told through a, a series of poems as opposed to a book length poem. Eric and I have worked on a couple books and I think we've done two where they were a series of poems and the rest have been book length poems that are either biographies or some other type of uh, nonfiction. These, the strengths of, I think, using poetry 
uh, for biographies are that you, I'm able to create an emotional context for the history and pack a more powerful punch than I think I could do with prose. I think the weaknesses are the same as the weaknesses might be for a book month poem. Um, you're not going to have footnotes, for example, in a poem. Usually, I mean, it, it, it kind of would mess up the, the, the look of the text on the page. So you're not going to have footnotes, although you might have, you, you might have notes and you do have, often I do have notes in the back of my books as I did with my uh, Fannie Mae Hamer book. Um, but the, the, I, I don't consider that a weakness. I consider it something to spur kids on to get more information about the subject matter for themselves. So that's where the value of the, of the back matter uh, comes into play. Um, there are, you know, suggestions for further reading and links to um, online resources and even to, uh, you know, places like the Library of Congress and museums, depending, you know, depending on, on the book. Um, I think ways that um, my books have been used in classrooms are, yeah, sometimes the poems are used, I think, as writing prompts to write other, other poems or to write um, pieces in the voice of a character. Um, those are just a couple of the things that have been shared with me uh, by teachers. Good question. Good answer. <clears throat> other questions? It looks like Vancouver's got a question. Terrific. <laughs> Uh, you're still muted, still unfortunately. Muted. We're unmuted there. Oh, okay, they oh, unmuted. All better. Oh, okay, so we're unmuted? Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Um, Fort Vancouver High School has a large Chukis population, and I've had a challenging time finding Polynesian cultural, well, particularly things that are fiction, Polynesian fiction, or in particular to the Micronesia and, and the Chuk Islands. Uh, and also, I'm wondering, I, I am thinking that it's very unlikely that I could find a lot that's actually in Chukis because it is more of an oral tradition. But those are kinds of things I'm looking for. Does the Library of Congress have materials about Micronesia, particularly fiction? That's a great question. I mean, I, and it's interesting. We've got a teaching with primary sources partner, um, actually, uh, one of our regional grantees in Hawaii who has been doing a great deal with um, materials related to Polynesia, but I think their focus has been mostly using maps and photographs, but I'll do a little digging and see what I can find. Um, but do you have more to? I, I can't imagine that there's quite a bit um, yeah. of material yeah. from the Polynesian Islands, yeah. but I don't have any names. But yeah, yeah but we'll we're do some digging, to definitely. Dig in and get back to you all with yeah. the material. <laughs> Thank you. I did find mythologies, some mythologies that are really nice that our mythology teacher has inserted into the mythology class because she wanted to, you know, include students, she wants to include all students in the class. But um, when it comes to, as a librarian, I want to have that represented in the fiction collection too in my library so that when kids come in, I can say, oh, well, by the way, <laughs> because it's very nice to honor everybody in the, in the building. That's exactly right, and I, I always have to sort of I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say, you know, there's 168 million items in the library's general collection. Chances are good. Yep. But until we actually find it and, and share it with you, I'm hesitant. But we'll look, certainly. Other questions? Schomburg's got another question. Yeah, I have a question about local libraries. <laughs> I live in an African diaspora and community, and the library does not reflect, the books in the library um, do not reflect that. And I've spoken to the head librarian, and I haven't really seen any kind of, um, you know, advancement in that. I mean, you have urban lit, but that's, to me, that's not literature. I mean, you know, to each her own or his own, but uh, there's plenty of books that you know, are coming out from African Americans, African Caribbeans, um, continental Africans that you know in two, 2018 that can be shown. And especially, I mean, I can go online and just you know order up a book, you know. But 
uh, especially for the younger people, they should be able to see them, you know, um, those books that are facing them, you know. Actually, what I, you're... My question is, how do I, what do I do to change the situation? Great question. Just before we started the program this afternoon, Maralisa and I were talking about exactly that and about what we do when we go into bookstores or into libraries and we don't see what we wish we saw. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I call it secret shopper, um, the secret shopper uh, tactic. I, I've been known to go into stores, libraries, all of these things and just be like, you know, where are the bilingual books? For example, I went to a bookstore one time and they were by the radiator, for example. Um, and I'm just sort of like, why is this displayed here? Let's talk about that for a second. Um, but I think also I've gone to libraries and said, you know, where are your, you know, Coretta Scott King award winners? Do you have a display for this or, or for whatever in particular? And I think it's important for each library and each community to have at least a display of some sort that reflects the actual uh, population, right, that's right around them. And to consider also how that population changes. So. Um, you know, maybe there's a particular group of immigrants that were part of it in the, in the 1920s or so, maybe at this moment, that's another situation, right? So um, I think it's, it's a matter of talking to uh, staff and um, asking those questions. I've come here before, actually, as a researcher to the, um, the historical collection, the children's literature collection, and actually asked, like, do you have books by Pura del Pre? You know, do you, do you have them that I can actually, or people that researchers can, can access? So. I think it's those little moments that actually can create a lot of change. Um, and I have seen displays change. So that's a practical way that I would say, mm -hmm. um, you know, that sometimes, uh, quite frankly, people are just not necessarily getting a lot of that kind of education about these different kinds of cultural competencies, right? Um, mm -hmm. And and it's, it's, it's important to ask those questions. Yeah, and I think it's... Oh, I, can I just jump in and say there's yeah. nothing stopping us also as members of the community cultivating a relationship with the librarian right. and purchasing the books ourselves. Right. I've made many donations to my local li library uh, of my own books and books mm -hmm. of others uh, because I felt that they were the missing voice in that particular right. library. And as a result, it inspired the librarians to purchase even more books. Um, so, you know, you have to sometimes be proactive. Um, in, in these kind of endeavors. Well, and I was going to say, and sometimes the librarians or the booksellers that you're talking to may or may not even be aware of the titles that you have in mind and sharing those titles, you know, the lists. Um, lots of organizations, the We Need Diverse Books Group, for example, Meg, you can certainly speak to this more than I can, but they're doing a great job of shedding light on some books that might not otherwise have gotten some attention, as well as the book lists that are developed by the American Library Association annually and other you know, professional associations that serve teachers, their trade book award winners are an excellent list, you know, lists to, to share as well. Um, but, but really, we all have a role to play. I think that's a great question and a great observation. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add is that this kind of work I have I've found in practical terms to be uh, the kind of work that is sometimes slow, yeah. sometimes frustrating, sometimes defeating, because it's like, rinse, what is it, wash, rinse, repeat, you know, like <laughs> lather, rinse, repeat. You feel like, wait, I've been here before. I've had this conversation before with the same person <laughs> last week or whatever, you know. So, um, you know, raising awareness, there, there's the raising of the awareness, and then there is helping that person move from the awareness to actual change in behavior. And it's not just libraries, right? It's the entire pipeline of, mm -hmm. of children's books, right? It's it's everything. It's from library school. How do, are we, do we have right. enough librarians of color, right? There's that. There's the publishing industry, like in all of its departments diversifying. It's libraries. It's school libraries. It's the classroom teacher right. curating a really full and thoughtful book list mm -hmm. with, with uh, his or her students. So... You know, what, mm -hmm. what I have found is just that it takes multiple conversations. It takes multiple points of entry. It takes asking for the books. When you go to ALA, when you go to these conferences, stop by the publisher's booth and ask who are the new voices coming out? What's Carol's new book? What's, you know, whatever. But you want to really create the reminder 
the endless reminder that there's interest and there's need for all of these voices. Well, I, like, I like to say that we as librarians need the public and we need these conversations because we don't know about every single book out there. And we, we also rely on, you know, we're always learning as librarians too, and, we, and this is how we get better. And it's really easy to, for someone to recommend something we don't have in their form and we can pull out and get the book with it. So, well, I think you have an interested um, customer out there because somebody has tweeted the question, is the Hispanic reading room by appointment only? No, it's not. <laughs> you can just walk in. We're open from uh, Monday to Fridays, uh, 8.30 to 5. But you can also reach us via Ask a Librarian, which is our online um, answering service. Um, we have a phone number, too. Um, I'll, I'll, should I give my our website? So, we can, yeah. so our website is uh, www.loc.gov. So that's the library's website. But then you add slash RR, which is stands for reading room, and then slash Hispanic. And um, on our website, we have our phone number. We have a link to our Ask a Librarian. If you have any questions about our collections, or if you can come to Washington, you can just come visit us. We're on the second floor right up here. I think our time is just about up. Um, I'm getting that look from a colleague across the room. We are so glad that you all joined us this afternoon and we're tickled that you're all over the country. Um, we hope this has been of interest and we really, really get it. Thank you again for joining us and, and uh, Feliz Dia. Bye. Feliz Dia. Bye. Bye.